Well, let, let me go ahead because it's five minutes after starting time, so I got to take five minutes off somebody's schedule, whatever that is, okay? I guess maybe when we eat or something like that. Okay. I'm Jim Powell, and welcome to our place. And uh, is Joe Beaver in the room? Okay. Tell them to get inside. They don't, can't, can't stand outside and talk, okay? <clears throat> What what we have tonight is a presentation by Matt Barton from Kansas, who does Bob's his own embryos, and he's going to give you a little story uh, about what he's doing and how he does it. Some of it's a video, and and some is he's just going to talk. So, and Marcus uh, asked me to go ahead and talk for him, so I'm not going to let him talk tonight. How that be, okay? Have y'all heard much of him today? Too much? Yeah, quite, a bit. <laughs> quite a bit. Okay, okay, very good, okay. Well, let me bring Matt up and and let him go ahead and, and get started, and, and then we will eat about 5.15, something like that, and then we'll let you look at the cattle in the barn if you want to, okay? Then we'll find the bus and load back up and send you home. That'd be good. You got a mic? I do. Okay, so uh, yeah, my name is Matt Barton and I'm from Salina, Kansas and my company is Embryon. Uh Thanks to Jim for having me out. Uh, I always enjoy getting to kind of talk to people about what we do. So in about 2014, give or take somewhere in there, we, my brother and I were uh, in business together and we had clients that were uh, dealing with DD and um, became aware to me that we could biopsy these embryos and try to help them bring these good donors back into the, into the herd of their donor program. And so uh, I made a small investment to turn into a larger investment uh, into learning how to biopsy embryos for uh, genomic or just to do gender and, and some recessive traits if we could. And uh, at the time I was sending my samples to the University of Illinois and uh, if they had a grad student uh, on staff you were okay and if you they didn't have a grad student there then you were out of luck. So for most of the summer I had no place to go with my samples and so uh, that kind of started a, a nice relationship with GeneSeq in Lincoln, Nebraska, and uh, led me into what we're going to talk about today. Um, and so that's my information. I jumped on the plane yesterday, and I forgot, uh, I forgot to bring business cards. So if anybody wants my information, yeah, just take a picture of that real quick. And uh, I usually respond to email pretty quickly. Phone's uh, the best way to get in contact with me. And I'll come back to this slide, and we're done. Um, so I'm really big on giving credit where credit's due. I wouldn't be here uh, today without the help of these three gentlemen. On the left, your left, would be John Hassler. So Dr. Hassler is a good, good friend of mine. He had the very first commercial ET practice in North America. He set it up in Pennsylvania uh, in 1980-81. Most of everything we still do in modern-day bovine embryology, uh, John was part of the lab at Colorado State that figured it out in the late 70s. And in the center is Dr. Glenn England. I work very closely with Dr. Glenn England of Sun Valley Embryo Transfer Center in Salina, Kansas. So uh, what we do is people, if we can get them to do it, is they bring donors to me locally. They're housed at Glenn's uh, facility. And then I just work with Glenn uh, to, to procure the embryos and then biopsy them. And then usually what we do is take them back up to him for transfer or to be frozen. He's been in practice since 1984. He does a very good job, um, can house 90 to 100 donors, no problem. And so I've just really learned a lot from him and 35 years of experience. And then on the right is Dr. Klaus Wiemer. So uh, a lot of what we do uh, in, the, in, the, in bovine embryology was picked up from the human side. And Klaus, uh, he ran Price's Dairy in New Mexico for a number of years before he went from grad school back to get a PhD. And now he owns his own human IVF lab in, in outside of Seattle, Washington. Um, and most everything that I continued to learn about embryo biopsy was from Klaus. Um, he used to fly into the lab in Wichita, Kansas. There was an IVF lab there. And I could, could drive down and spend time with Klaus. And he's a, he's a wealth of knowledge. Uh, been all over the world, literally 
biopsying embryos, and I've always enjoyed uh, being able just to talk to him and, and learn from, again, his years of experience. So, and the last one is uh, this gentleman, uh, Dr. Stuart Bach. He is the vice president of GeneSeq. Um, he manages all their labs, which are worldwide now. Uh, but when I went to GeneSeq uh, many years ago, um, we sat down and had a discussion of what this possibly could look like. And there, you know, uh, wasn't much there to put on paper, and they they agreed at that time to to try and start to work on this uh, at a research and development basis. And um, there's been times where they're kind of dragging me or I drag them, but it's been a very nice uh, working relationship that we've had. They've been able to figure out things that uh, I doubt many other places could. They are a repository of just some really smart people, and so I owe Dr. Bach and his team at GeneSeq a, a lot, and we have uh, another person. I go to go to Lincoln to their lab quite often. We have wonderful discussions about where we're trying to drive this technology and what it could mean to different producers. Um, so Dr. Hassler has um, published data for over 30 years in the bovine embryology world. His data sets continue to be some of the largest out there. And I show this slide just to kind of put out, um, you know, the, the gap between fresh and frozen embryos. Now, John's are probably a little higher than what you'd see out commercially doing ET work, um, you know, but he controlled a lot of his process back in the day uh, is what I would probably say about that. And these are the data sets that he put together for uh, fresh embryos that had been transferred versus fresh embryos that had been biopsied and transferred. And he showed that across the board, you're going to see about a 10 percentage point uh, drop. And then that's another slide where he shows, um, you can see on the right hand side over here, if I can get the, you can't see the the laser on. On the right hand side, you can see the percent pregnant. You can see in parentheses his conception data. Um, I usually present John's data because my data sets are small enough that they haven't had meaning, but they're starting to grow. Um, I figured them up the other day, and across the board, everything I've done where it was uh, either shipped to my lab or Dr. England had the donor and I got the embryos and we biopsied them, froze them, and then we had them transferred. I'm right at about 49% conception. Um, and so what we do, you know, in modern day uh, ET, typically I want a, what would be a number six or a number seven there. And that, you can see like a number six, half of it on the left hand side's got the fluid filled cavity or the blastocele. So those are the, the cells there would be the trophectoderm cells or what becomes the placenta. And that's what I would take for my biopsy. The darker area to the right on uh, number six there would be the inner cell mass or what becomes the calf. So you can see from six to seven, trophectoderm cells have just continued to grow and, and, and uh, multiply. And so you can take a nice size biopsy and be left with plenty of embryo to freeze and go ahead and make a pregnancy later on. And this is the setup that I used. This was a small little blade that they'd use. They used to use it for eye surgery in an ophthalmologist clinic. And uh, John set it up many years ago to do embryo biopsy with, and it works quite well. So the embryo is just, uh, this is a little video of it, but we just put them on a dish, and uh, it's a protein-free media, so the embryos stick to the dish, and then we just have a little mechanical uh, arm, and we can drop the blade down on the biopsy. And this isn't actually from my lab. I found this on, online, but it's a pretty good depiction of what we do. So he'll just continue to, to drop it down. He'll roll it kind of to the 6 o'clock position and then just make a little biopsy there of those cells. And there he did it. And now he'll draw the blade back, and you'll see the embryo on top and the biopsied cells in the bottom. And so what we do now is... We'd recover the embryo, we give it a little time to heal, and then we post-biopsy evaluate them to make sure that they're demonstrating the characteristics that we'd want to see of a healthy embryo. And the biopsy there at the bottom, we just pick that up, and we would go ahead and amplify that DNA. And we'll talk about that here in a minute, too. So there's the embryo, and it sinks to the bottom, and you can see where he cut 
down there at about the seven o'clock position. Now that blastocele, that cavity that was filled will go ahead and collapse, but very quickly it'll start to re-expand. They, they, uh, a, a good functioning embryo does not take very long to go ahead and heal itself. So these are embryos that were shipped to my lab uh, from Texas. Um, the interesting thing is in the top slide, the very top embryo on the right was actually dead. Uh, the day before, it would have been called a grade one embryo. And this is something that we see if, you know, if, if I'm sent 20 embryos, uh, almost across the board, one if not two of them will be dead the next day. And so what we've learned, what the, the human side of this has all learned, is that as you start to apply uh, the, the necessity of embryos to, to continue to divide or have cleavage of cells, you can start to learn a lot about their, their health. And so, you know, that embryo would have been frozen the day before as a grade one and expected to make, you know, a 55% conception rate when it never had what it needed to go ahead and function and live anyway. Uh, but these are embryos that would have been collected at day six in Texas and then put into culture media in a vial and just overnight shipped to my lab. So for clients that don't bring donors to Dr. England's place, this is what we've adapted from the IVF world to, to go ahead and continue to get uh, embryos into our lab. And then these same embryos with the biopsies that I made, and uh, you can see it's pretty much the same as what the video showed. That's an embryo. These were both uh, early blasts. You can see on the embryo that still has the zone around it, at about the one or two o'clock position, it has a blastocele there. And on the same embryo to the left, you can see where I made the biopsy. Uh, it has just a few cells that are kind of straggling off there still. And this is embryos that would have been collapsed after they've biopsied, and this was a short time after. And uh, this is typically what we want to see is the, the blastocele cavity is starting to re-expand. That happens at a fairly specific time frame after the biopsy. Uh, but in the first five pictures, you can see th that's very indicative to us of the health of the embryo. The very last embryo died, and that is something that we see. Uh, sometimes the biopsy will kill the embryo, and that's why we do a post-biopsy ob observation is so that we, you know, you certainly wouldn't want to freeze that embryo. But the rest of those were frozen, and uh, two of those, well, there was five embryos. Two of those five actually made pregnancies for that client, so. Uh, so, DNA. Um, this is basically what we're, we're testing for. Um, these double helix structures, DNA, and you see the, the bases. There's four bases. Um, the human genome, genome and the bovine genome uh, pretty closely have about three billion bases. I like to show this. So if this was a 1280 by 80 screen and you put one base on every pixel, you'd need about 3,000 screens to handle all the base pairs within the, the human or the, the bovine genome. And so what GeneSeq does is they have chips and they you know, might have 30 or 50,000 markers or whatever it is, and they just give you a genomic prediction on a live calf or your embryo off of those chips. So uh, you can see the arrow there. That's pointing to uh, the biopsy at the bottom of a tube that I would send. That's about two microliters of fluid, so with the naked eye you wouldn't be able to see that. And we take that biopsy, and now the trick is is that we have to amplify it. Um, so think of that biopsy is a bushel basket of corn. And what we have to do so the GeneSeq has enough DNA to run through their pipeline is turn that bushel basket of corn basically into two semi-trailer loads of corn. And we do that with a process called whole genome amplification, and it's pretty hard to do. Uh, but we've gotten better over time. We continue to get better with it. Uh, the other thing we can do to help this out is we genotype the dam and sire at the same time. So when I send my samples to GeneSeq, I send a blood card from the donor and a, a blood card with a little semen on it from the sire. And GeneSeq will genotype the dam and sire. And so areas in the, in the embryo genome where we might have what's called allele fallout, where there's no information at all, we can plug in the dam and sire's information there and start to build that genotype back up on the embryo so we have something good enough to use. What we can also do is find where there's areas where the information might be wrong from the amplification. So let's say at a site the embryo says it's AB, but at that site the dam is AA, and at that site the sire is AA, then we know the calf has to be, or the embryo in this case, has to be AA. And so GeneSeq has that pipeline that they just continue to try and uh, make better. But that's kind of the process, or is the process, of what we do once we send our embryos in. And so, 
what we found is that it's what you guys probably see every day of the week is the significant variation that you'll have between full siblings. So these were, this was a group of embryos uh, that we did that all shared, this, this is in an IVF uh, situation, but these embryos all shared the same sire. This is on uh, three different dams, but you can see the significant variation that you start to witness in full sibling matings. And so um, with embryo biopsy, you can start to pick out the embryos that you want to put in versus those that you don't want to put in and uh, save yourself a lot of time and effort. And this was a study that uh, we used to build our pipeline at GeneSeq uh, that came out of Canada. And this was on, I think it was 226 dairy calves that they, dairy Holstein embryos, they'd have been full-blooded Holstein embryos that they biopsied, gave a genomic prediction on, and then they followed it through and pulled a tail hair follicle on the calf. And you can see that their, their prediction on the embryo was just spot on with what the actual calf on the ground was. And so we kind of used this as our recipe as we went through and built our pipeline for Angus. And this is a slide that they put together for me just showing once the embryos come in, you know, they have very specific uh, steps in their protocol that they use to make sure that the imputation process is right at GeneSeq. But what you're left with uh, at the end of the day, this is, um, well, this is one calf in a group of embryos that was born, and we compared our, our genotyping prediction on the embryo to that of the, of the calf. And so at the, the first uh, bracketed area here, down at the bottom, the delta MBV, that's just how close the match was from the calf, the difference between the prediction for the calf and the embryo. So you can see, you know, carcass weight 0.03, we were pretty close. And we were pretty close on all of them. I just highlighted a few of them. But this is what we've seen on the calves that we've run back through for concordances on our predictions to the biopsy. That's another slide of the same thing. Uh, for that calf, you can see that when we did the original genotyping, the first line, we were left with almost 15% error rate in the genotype. And then we used uh, the pipeline with the parent correction to clean it up, and we got it down to 8.4. And then they did their little process where they phase it in with whatever they do. I can't even explain it. But the end result was a genotype that, that matched it a little, it was not even 3.2% off. So... Um, and we've actually gotten a little better since then, but that's pretty darn good for your prediction from an embryo to the calf. And so what this means is that, you know, to start with, you can start making these selections earlier than you were before, and that's, that's the goal. Um, used to be what would take you two or three years you can do before the embryo is even put into a cow now. Uh, Dr. Gibb, Dr. Jim Gibb that used to work for GeneSeq put this slide together for me. This is uh, modeled for dollar B. Uh, the gray line, the second line from the bottom, is the actual witnessed increase in dollar B for Angus for the last 10 years. And if you look at the, um, what is it, the green, the, the blue line. Uh, the blue line he did showing or simulating 25% of the offspring would be product of uh, or 20% would be a product of biopsied embryo transfer, so you knew what you had, you knew that you wanted it. And you can see how your genetic gain starts to take off. And then the green line would be 25% uh, biopsied embryo transfer. So it doesn't take much intensity of selection to really start making a drastic difference in the rate of genetic gain within your program. And then this is another slide he did where he kind of just got crazy. The black line was 65% of your offspring being uh, biopsied embryo transfer, but it really starts to take off in your favor. And this is work that Dustin Aheron did. Um, he's a PhD student at K-State, and he's doing some really interesting stuff. He actually just got done taking a semester of classes for his PhD at MIT. Uh, what he's doing doesn't fit in any pretty little box that anybody has, but he took a, it's called RISC, it's a, it's a financial tool that the retirement world would use to model retirement for people. And he converted it to do real-time uh, analysis of bovine IVF and ET um, work. And what he showed using my data sets, and this was published as part of his thesis to validate his thesis, is that on a day of transferring embryos, if you just transferred 25 that you knew you wanted versus 50 that just, you know, guessing by golly, uh, 
really what we're driving is that on number 16 there, the variable expenses, we cut your expenses quite a bit. And remember, we're still going to offer the genetic gain that, you know, you probably wouldn't have had otherwise. But your return on investment, to spend that much less money in today's age and return your, your ROI is that much greater, almost 7%, that's hard to do. Um, Dustin ran this too if you had another 25 embryos that you knew you wanted, and so you, you transferred 50 for 50. And those numbers really start to take off in favor of um, biopsy. And so I need uh, a couple of volunteers real quick just to kind of illustrate this. So can just two people come stand up here for me real quick? I need one more. So we're going to walk that way, but not yet. So stand right here next to him. So, so you got first, so you're doing biopsy to embryo transfer, transferring embryos that way. You're just guessing by golly. So uh, you can take first year of production. You go ahead and take two steps. You can take one step. So in first year, he outpaced his competition in genetic gain. He saved enough money to go ahead and replace five miles of that fence that needs replaced. So the next year, take three steps, and you can take two. So the next year of production, he's still outpacing and saved enough money to go ahead and buy that skid steer to help replace all that fence that he needs to replace. So last year, take four, and you can take three. Still outpacing the competition and saved enough money to go ahead and buy a brand new truck to drive around and look at all of his brand new fence. So, uh, and that, I kind of blew through probably too quickly but that'll get us back on schedule. That's what we do. Um, this is kind of where we're at with the technology uh, in my little lab in central Kansas. Um, I like to give credit where credit's due. I wouldn't be anywhere without uh, Jesus working in my life. And uh, with that, we'll open it up to questions and kind of wrap it up here. Um, if you're willing to bring a donor to me, who asked the question there? We, we're going to give you a microphone so we can get it on tape. For a small producer, uh, what's the advantage? I mean, I know you can see this, but um, cost compared to... So I charge $100 a biopsy, and uh, by the time we amplify it, that's another 35 and then GeneSeq's going to charge you 45 to run it on the chip. If you bring a donor to Dr. England's, I give a 25% discount on my work. Um, so for the small, for the small producer, the the advantage is in, I mean, it's in the fantastic utilization of recips, only carrying embryos that you want. You're not going to have calves born that would never make your sale or be a heifer you wanted offspring out of in the first place. Really, what the driving factor of all this is the recip. Um, you know, far too there's a lot of embryos of fairly poor quality genomically that are transferred every year, and you know, in the cattle industry, to transfer an embryo and wait nine months to have a calf that you have to deal with for however long, the better decision you can make before that pregnancy is ever created, you've done yourself a big favor. Anybody else? What would be the what? The, the question is, the donor, you bring the cow to you, and you all do the flush, and then you all produce, get the eggs, and, and do that work. So what would be a, a total cost of, from well, a uh, small farmer like us? No, um, Dr. England's rates to house a donor are pretty much the same as everybody else that does ET work. I think he's $5 a day to house a donor. I think he's 250 to flush, and then he's 40 to freeze. Okay. So... Most all of them are pretty much in the same window of what they charge. What's the percentage of late-term abortions versus conventional flush embryos and IVF embryos? I don't think I've seen any information on that, but in the human world, it's negligible. It 
once they make the pregnancy, it's the biopsy isn't going to be what causes it to abort or not. National average is seven per collection in both the United States and Canada. What's your conception rate after biopsy versus a standard everyday flush? What's the percentage of on a recips that are caught? On a frozen? Mm -hmm. So Canada just reported their numbers. They transfer more frozen embryos in Canada than we do in the United States. And at the AETA convention next month, they'll report a 54% conception rate for frozen embryos across the board. I'm at about 49% across the board with what I do. The advantage, well, for me, it's I don't have to ship incubators out. I don't have to prep vials. I don't have to put you know, media, you guys are getting your own media. The big advantage is we don't take the risk of having an incubator lost in uh, UPS. Your last incubator, I had to chase UPS around for half the morning before I finally procured it at one o'clock when it was supposed to be delivered at nine. It's because the plane was late. And we have had incubators not make the plane and it's a loss. And if you've ever done IVF, that's something you deal with. So it's just another layer of risk that we can remove by having them there. And that's why, you know, you overnight ship an incubator, you can start to pencil out keeping a cow at Dr. England's uh, for about a month or more for what it costs to overnight ship early AM deliver an incubator. Um, and it's just, again, it doesn't matter if it's UPS or FedEx, they just, it's, it is going to happen. So that's, you know, aside from it just makes my world easier, it's just, you know, uh, a little bit more congruent. If I was to send a donor up there, how long would you keep her? How often would y'all flush if, say, I was, say, keep her three months? Well, how many flushes would you? Glenn would do it about every six weeks. Every six weeks. Mm -hmm. Now, he has had people bring donors up that he'll do OPU on in between that. He could do a couple OPUs on them uh, in between there. But uh, for me, it would be about every six weeks what it works out to be. He tries to set everything up off natural heats as much as he can. You had mentioned on um, if embryos were being shipped to you, I'm assuming they're probably collected on the farm on day six. That's right. Uh, so you get them on day seven. Mm -hmm. Are you then still waiting that extra day to, to check them post biopsy? No, the, the post biopsy thing we do pretty quickly after after okay. we've made the biopsy, it doesn't, we don't let it sit for very long. You can tell within a few hours if it's, the embryo is still going to be viable or yeah, not. Yeah, not even okay. a couple hours usually. Okay. Yeah. Uh, there's a quote, they talk about having five regions of cattle in the United States. Is there any discussion of maybe you know branching out to where you could have one in the southeast in the northeast other than just sending them all the way to nebraska every time as far as to gene seek mm -hmm. oh i i don't know i mean for me to send the biopsies off to gene seek is not a big deal well how about you oh, have you just have you did have you thought about you know getting um, into different regions well to do what i do is pretty specialized i don't know at this point how i would do it uh, to train somebody and we've discussed it but I mean you know to sit down and say I'm going to do manage a whole group of donors and manage a whole group of recips and flush eight cows a day and I'm going to biopsy that probably wouldn't work that's you know the days I biopsy that's all I do and uh, well and Okay. Oh, I, yeah. And so I'm in Salina, Kansas, central Kansas, and I understand what you're saying. Um, you know, I'm a, I'm a small business in every sense of the word, so, I mean, that might be something we look at as time goes on, but as of right now, that's really not 
what I'm capable of doing. Yeah, and we've had a lot of people that are pretty okay with just doing that, so. Typically, if people want to do that, uh, what I do is just set up a real quick phone call between Glenn and I and that person so they can meet him and understand, you know, his cost structure and what the plan would be, and it works very well. So, and Glenn offers recips too. We've had a lot of people put embryos in that we do this with at his place, and then you can buy a pregnant recip or go pick the calf up. It's whatever you want to do. Understand? No, and and yeah, then most of them stay for a while. Especially, you know, looking at now where we're at, um, we were so hot in the summer there in Kansas that, you know, most of June and July were just a loss. It was just so hot. Uh, but now, you know, in our in, in my neck of the woods, it's you know we're starting to kind of ramp up and think what we're going to do now. October it starts to get pretty busy, and then it climaxes at about April. May, April. Uh, could you comment a little bit about, um, I, I know you, everything you've mentioned is unconventional. Um, is IVF produced embryos? I, I know they look different. I mean, I've seen them there on day six and seven or whatever. It, it's a different embryo. So does this process work on there? Because everything you said really went with conventional. And so we have the lab that Klaus, the guy I showed, that he used to fly into, the human lab in Wichita, Kansas. We actually took ownership of that a year ago and converted it to do bovine IVF. And so we have biopsied embryos that we've, uh, we've biopsied IVF embryos that we've made in that lab, transferred them fresh. It's been really small numbers, but the results were good. The problem is freezing those embryos. And I, you know, we We've thought, we've talked, we've, we've tried vitrifying some of them, and it's hit or miss. We'd probably go back and uh, to, to the glycerol freeze method. And, you know, if the value's there for the embryos you want, then it's worth the time to go ahead and thaw them with the three-step glycerol process. And so um, we're kind of shut down right now because of the heat, but once we ramp back up, we'll probably do a couple small little studies just biopsy embryos, freezing them with glycerol, thawing them out, do we make pregnancies, and then give it a go. And that's where the, the dairy guys, Holstein is really interested in that. But I just, at this point, don't have a good avenue to freeze those embryos where I could hang my hat on it. Matt, let me make a couple of comments. We, we've, we're doing an 18-month event here. And what we're trying to do is to do based on his recommendation, the conventional flush. And what we're trying to do is to look at the embryo and do the sex on it, and then send it off to GeneSeq, and they do, and he can explain what this is, a enhanced EPDs, which is within 3 or 4% of what the blood test is, we think. So what we're trying to do is to eliminate raising animals that we can't sell in our sale. And we've not been trying to raise bulls, but now with this program, we can pick out a few bulls out of our embryos that we think are at the top of our, what we're doing. And we think we can raise those and sell them in our sale. Uh, but, but we've not used any sex semen at this point in what we're doing. Now, we're probably gonna try that soon, and, and that eliminates the bulls again, because we don't try to raise bulls, but I guess what we're trying to do is not raise a calf that we can't, that doesn't meet our criteria of the numbers that we're trying to put together. And so we're doing this on 18 months, and we're gonna, we're gonna try to give UT the data that we produce and see if they will give us a thumbs up or thumbs down or if they want to get involved with us in some way uh, to see if this is something that we would like to do on a continued basis because we've been doing IVF for three years using sorted semen and we sort it when we do the fertilization in the dish 
So we don't have to buy sex semen. We just have to have semen that'll sort. And we've been along pretty good, but we still have to cull about 40%. They don't make the EPDs that we're trying to make. And you saw that on your on your screen there, that you have all, all over the place. And, and we got two flushes back the other day, and we culled, I call it culled, we took out of that group four embryos. And they were all based on birth weight. All the rest of the numbers were, were we could use, but the birth weight was in the fours. And so, you know, still we end up with, I think, 16 uh, that, that meet our criteria out of those two flushes together. So we don't know if we're heading in the right direction, but we, we are comfortable enough to try to continue. We've been in about four months, and we're going to do it 18 months and look at the dollars and cents and it costs us versus the number of animals that we can raise and be able to sell without culls. But we have, you know, we have three or four different levels of sales. So what we're trying to do is make them all the sell here on our place. I think that's a, a better place than going somewhere else. But that's kind of what we're doing. And we, we should be able quarterly to be able to get a report out on number of embryos that we decide to use, the number of implants, the number of confirmed pregnancies, and then it's going to take us a while to get that nine months on the ground, and then it takes another two months to get the blood work back from GeneSeq. So it's, a, it's not a little short process. It may take us two, two and a half years to be able to make a, a, a financial decision. heat two or three times so are you is there a best time of the year and a certain temperature that if you're doing transfers and you transfers that you suggest that's not the state? well it, in in my state we you know typically we try we have the best results in the fall and through the spring um heat's pretty bad you know for oocytes and semen and making you know the, the embryo is pretty vulnerable the first three days so um well it, it, i mean we've had bad days where we chalk it up to the cold but i mean it's not as destructive as the heat as long as nutrition's there and whatnot i mean it'll stress the animal but you know when you're like we've been you know 108 109 with the heat index all day long you know you can those cows never cool off in the evenings you know they're they never reach their equilibrium again and they just you can't you can't have much success in that environment so typically like right now august june july and august we don't do much et work a lot of those guys just go on vacation that's their couple months off for the year No more questions? Where's Jimmy at? I asked him if they could move the, check with him and see if he can move the, if they move the dinner from 5.30 to 5, 5.15. I'd hate to wait 30 minutes on email. <laughs> so, uh, I guess we, we think this is really intriguing. And what we're trying to do is to get the EPDs that we're trying to make at the end of nine months, we're trying to get those before we put the embryo in. And that should help us with our elimination of making calves that we don't need. Now, somebody may say that's, that's all right, but for us, what we're trying to do is we, we got a certain thing we want to do, and we like to get to that point. So maybe in six months now, we, we can give you an update <laughs> as, as to how we're getting along. Tom, you want to give us an observation? No, not an observation. I've got a question. <clears throat> you've now got this embryo, and you've DNA'd it, and you've put it in. And how accurate will that be? Will you DNA it again after it's born? Yeah. And how? what will be the correlation between the two? Well, like I showed on the slide, it should be pretty 
You'd be pretty close. Pretty close. And the, two to three percent. And the ones that the, the ones that don't measure up, they get destroyed. The ones that don't measure the, up. The, 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 let's say that they're like a high birth one. So, yeah, you'd call you the cull. I guess is the word I need to use. They get culled. Just stay in the in the tank. Okay. Now, have you ever done this on humans? Say that again. Is this done on humans? Well, yeah, every day okay. of the week. It's done now. Tell us world. about that. Um, so, in the human world, they found that uh, couples that have trouble getting pregnant, in a high instance, in a high number of cases, it's because they have some sort of anomaly like Down syndrome or cystic fibrosis or one of the trisomies. And if you can take a group of in vitro produced embryos and biopsy them and find the one that doesn't have that genetic anomaly, the mother will go, the woman will go ahead and carry the pregnancy to term just fine. So you pre-sort the embryos in before you put them in? Yeah. They, they vitrify them and they wait for a month for the data to come back in. And that happens all over the world. Okay. Um, That's actually happened. But every day. Every day. So my friend Klaus, he has a lab, he has two biopsy rigs running every day of the week. I don't know how many embryos they biopsy every day, but it's a bunch. No. Now, we might be putting Alan on the spot, but the association is working with him. Do you have any comments about what you're doing here? We're excited about it. Well, Matt and I were talking earlier. He's worked uh, closely with Dr. Moser and Dr. Miller, and they're very excited about the technologies, uh, the technology rather, but uh, there's ways to go yet. And then, of course, the cost factor will have to sort itself out in the marketplace. But we're, we're excited about the technology. And, and next week, Matt, right, they're going to be selling some of the, the embryos down in Texas. Yeah. Uh, next week at uh, Lance Fenton at Lazy F Ranch, his sale in Bullard, Texas, I believe. Um, we worked with him and Dr. Uh, Pollard, Barry Pollard, uh, this past spring and made some genotyped uh, female pregnancies and recips that are going to sell in their sales. So we'll see. Uh, how that goes, but the prediction came from AGI and is published in the sale catalog. And so, so the uh, if you saw the ad in the Angus Journal, uh, this most recent issue, I don't remember exactly, but it referenced the embryo came from God. Yeah, right. that was Lance. Yep. <clears throat> yeah, and um, so I got a call about it, wanting to know if that was really true. And uh, well, actually, I got a call from somebody on staff and said, "You're going to get some complaints about this. You better be ready." And I said, "Let me guess, that's Lazy F because th I'm supposed to be there next Saturday." And they said, well, oh, boy, that's going to be a good one. And I said, actually, that ad is correct. And she said, no, 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 that's not. She goes, I said, God creates everything. He creates EPDs. She said, no, Dr. Crouch created EPDs, and then they come from a computer. And I said, but who created computers? She, she said, I said, man did. And who created man? God did. So by proxy, that ad was right. right? I would agree with you. Well, what we're trying to do here is is step ahead and and not raise anything we can't sell that we want to sell. And if this works, it'll change. It go from the the AI to the ET to the biopsy, and we, we can raise exactly what you want by getting the enhanced EPDs before you put the embryo in. Now you say, well, that's not possible. It may not be, but the history says it's two to three percent. I think we can live at two or three percent if you can not raise or not spend six thousand dollars on a calf that you can't sell. So that, that's kind of where we are, and we'll, we'll see how it works out. Yes, sir. So th that gives me a question of. From the biopsy, can you determine um, the genetic defects like the DD and the OH and cull those out based on from that that biopsy or is that post? If it, it's tough. DD will make you look foolish really quick. Um, I tell people that bring donors that want to do DD, your results are going to be somewhere between 0 and 100%. Um, it's because you can't, 
uh, you can't impute from Dam and Sire to get a result. It's just, it is what it is. And we've had days where it goes really good, and we've had days where it just goes really poorly. So, I mean, if you're comfortable with that risk, we've done it and we do it, but um, it, and DD's, it's just difficult. It's difficult. What about some of the other gen genetic defects? We've done that have NH. Um, we do most all of them in Wagyu. Uh, we've done DD, NH. I think that's about it, honestly. Horn pulled isn't too good. It's kind of a tough one. Not all recessives are the same, so. Are we eventually going to get to be like the dogs? They've so bred them so genetically, such and such, that now they've got brittle bones. They've got this, that. I mean, they, the list is innumerable. Whereas the Heinz 57 <laughs> is the perfect little dog. Yeah, I don't know. I are can't we, are we going to go too far? I don't know. I can't, I can't That's answer That's what I'm afraid of. We're going to go too far pushing all this. Whereas Mother Nature made the bull and Mother Nature made the cow. Let Mother Nature take care instead of us playing God, like they say, play God in between. I think it's what he said a while ago. If you're willing to take the chance, do it. If you don't, don't do it. That's where you are. If you're willing to take the chance, then try it. If you aren't, then don't. They have sent me word that supper's ready. And I've been told we should eat. Now, if any of you want to continue to keep talking to him, we'll let him go first and sit on the outside of where the name plates are. And if you want to continue to talk with him, get your food and go sit close to him, and we'll continue the conversation. Then after about... 30 minutes or so when we kind of get through eating we'll go through the barn and let you look at our sale cattle for our October I mean our no, December sale and Joe Beaver will explain before we go out there kind of what we were looking at and what we're trying to do are you okay with that so we'll let Matt go first and get his plate and get it set down and if you want to sit close to him and talk to him you're welcome 